ever wondered what some of the rundown areas in Sunderland used to look like? Holmeside, the bottom of Forsted Street and Blandford Street are often shunned, with even myself not really going to these sections of Sunderland city centre. Within the unloved buildings are some real gems, from two Art Deco cinemas, a forgotten train station and even the rumours of a Cold War bunker underneath the old Civic Centre. We start today's video at the bottom of Forsted Street and Burden Road, looking at the Sunderland Museum in Winter Gardens. This was the first municipally funded museum in the country outside of London. Opposite the museum is the Yates pub with a beautiful complimenting style that I think is underrated for being hidden down the side of the town. Established originally in the Athenaeum building on Forsted Street, the museum moved to this building in 1879 and it was based on a model of the Crystal Palace in London. The idea of the Winter Gardens is thought to have originated from plant collectors in the 19th century who would show off their exotic plant collections within elaborate conservatories to display them whilst protecting them from the weather. On the 16th of April 1941, an exploding parachute mine was dropped onto the Winter Gardens by a German bomber, destroying it completely. Apparently the museum and Winter Gardens also suffered four incendiary bombs falling on the museum and Winter Gardens on another night. The janitor's wife and two daughters used buckets of sand to extinguish the fires, saving the building. Today the museum and winter garden still stand, but in a more modern style, looking out into Mowbray Park with its bronze walrus and the Victoria Hall Disaster Memorial. Our next historic gem is opposite the Cenotaph up Burden Road, the forgotten Forsted Street train station. The Forsted Street station opened on the 1st of June 1853, at the height of the Victorian heyday for railways. It was the eastern terminus of the York, Newcastle and Berwick railway route from Leamside and Pensher. A year after it opened, the line became part of the North Eastern Railway, alongside the Monkweamouth station. The North Eastern Railway didn't spend lavishly on the design of the Forsted Street station, but it did consist of a single storey brick building with some decorative details. I love that the drinking fountain bears the Sunderland crest and motto, and it's still been in the wall over 150 years later. I wonder if this arch detail had a bell originally as it looks like something's missing. A new central station was built in the town centre, leading to the station to close on the 4th of August 1879, with the building being converted into housing and then being demolished. Only the gate posts and the drinking fountain remain today. To get to Homeside we head back down Burden Road and then turn right. Homeside is definitely a shadow of its former self, originally a busy Edwardian shopping destination. From Joseph's Toys, Ibbotson's Butchers for savoury dips, to Sergeant Pepper's Jeans, you could spend hours wandering about here. Currently this area is changing dramatically, but you can still just about see the Civic Centre in the distance in the process of being demolished. Did you know that there's a Cold War bunker underneath it that's now lost to history? Situated under the Civic Centre, the Cold War Bunker measured 32 by 7 metres with two main rooms accessible by a spiral staircase. The origins of the bunker is a mystery, however as it had elaborate ventilation provisions, it could have been a regional war room. In this pile of rubble was the old Sinatra's bar that was knocked down last year, but I managed to take some old photographs. Before this building was Sinatra's, it had a number of owners including Sir Edward Walker and Robert Wilson, who had a wholesale newspapers, booksellers and stationers here on Homeside. Upon further research, it also apparently used to be Warby's chip shop in a garage, but I think it would have made a fabulous art deco cinema or music hall. This corner shop was nicknamed Maynard's Corner, with many people buying sweets here before heading to the Audion further down the road. 
Next door was Joseph's Toy Shop, a favourite by many for selecting their presents to write on their list to Santa. Known for its memorable toy and railway displays, Joseph's was actually founded in 1881 as a manufacturer of harnesses and palmanto. Due to the rise of sporting activities, sporting goods started to be introduced, with their tennis rackets being highly sought after by some of the leading players of the day. Union Street, where Joseph's had located, was heavily bombed during World War II, but Joseph's still remained before moving to Homeside for the last years of trading. As we walk down Homeside, a lot of the old shops have gone. A high quality confectioner's called Gardeners was directly opposite the Audion Cinema, closing super late at 9pm to catch the evening cinema goers. From Turvey's Garage, Bin's Furnishing to the Northumbria Printing Works, all replaced now with various food takeaway shops now. We now come to the mecca of the street, if you pardon the pun. This was the Black's Regal Cinema, opening in 1932. An ornate interior reflected the glamour of the Hollywood film shown on the screen, with the dancing lady grill through which the organ sounded being still in the building today. The cinema had a Compton Theatre organ, as well as a cafe and a roller rink. In 1955, Black Regal was renamed the Audion and was divided into three screens 20 years later. Heading deeper into Homeside, we pass what was the old Bentley nightclub in the 80s and 90s. Just opposite though is a building which has been selling furniture since 1904. This striking building was designed by Hedley Green for Laidler Robson, a four-storey furniture shop and workshop. In the 1930s, it was a car sales room for bins and then was used for its original purpose of furniture sales after the bin store on Forster Street was badly damaged in World War II. It has now been owned by Thursby's for many years, carrying on the furniture tradition on Homeside. At the top end of Homeside's arguably the most forgotten history gem, with the only hints to its origin being the art deco details to the side and the front of the building. This was the art deco Ritz Cinema. This cinema opened on the 1st of March 1937, with the first film being Swing Time, featuring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, which is coincidentally one of my favourite films ever. No expense was spared at the Ritz, with chandeliers and deep pile carpets creating a luxury experience for cinema goers, with it being so popular that there were long queues outside waiting for the first and second house shows of the night. I've always felt that this fountain has been here forever, but it's not actually in its original spot. This interesting Victorian drinking fountain used to be located on Vine Place but was relocated here in 1999. A long fine place is an interestingly spelt sign that I must show you. These properties were built between 1816 and 1826, with the gardens being built over and the houses being converted into shops in the late 19th century. Just above number nine fine place is a mysterious fishy sign. It's a mystery to where this fishy sound and vine place sign has come from, but it looks to have been repurposed from an ancient wall or somewhere else. Whilst filming along vine place, I had to cross the road and take a closer look at something interesting above one of the windows at the tonic bar. The large arched window appears to have a ghost sign above it with very faded writing. In the 1930s, it looks like number 12 Vine Place was a printer and stationers. It's so funny how you think you can know a lot about your home city until you look up. I want to know more about this, so watch this space. The Cooper Rose Weatherspoons pub stands on what was three 19th century private residences called Albion Place. Dr Henry Rennie was living here in 1890, with his thoughts on public vaccinations being published in the British Medical Journal ten years later. 
Dr Henry advocated the use of the Cooper Rose vaccination, which he carried with half an ounce of antiseptic, more than enough for nine arms, probably saving so many lives. The John Priestman building sits over the road, originally built in 1939 as a library. John Priestman was a shipbuilder in Sunderland and charity benefactor, whose trust maintained churches and schools. In 1939, he financed £20,000 for the construction of this building, originally used as a library for Sunderland Technical College. I think one of my favourite buildings in Sunderland has to be this old technical college on Green Place, which apparently had a specialism for pharmacy. The college opened in 1901, with the principal and four full-time lecturers in charge of four departments, chemistry, mechanical and civil engineering, physics and electrical engineering. It was expected that 200 students would enrol at the college's opening, but nearly 700 applied. It is claimed that Sunderland College was the first to introduce sandwich courses in 1903, allowing students to have industry experience as well as tutoring. Nearly a hundred years later, the Sunderland Polytechnic was recognised as university status. We now see the wonderful old Ritz Cinema again as we head on our last destination, Blandford Street. The Beehive pub on the corner has had many reinventions over the years and now is seemingly a Sunderland institution. Blandford Street has also seen many reinventions too with the city centre as a whole being in a huge amount of change. Blandford Street was a very busy shopping street back in the day. However, it has since been pedestrianised, which I feel has changed its fortunes. From getting your weekly Savaloy dips from Ibbotson's, Blacklock's the Jewellers, to underage pints in the Blandford, there are lots of happy memories about the old Sunderland days. There's a lot of construction here at the moment to connect a new road that will stretch right across the top of Blandford Street. Just on this corner is a hint at this street's past. Berg's Record Shop. The old Berg sign was uncovered recently during development. Berg's Record Shop was the place to be in the 1960s. A bustling place to buy the latest LPs with many being exciting imports from overseas. Known for being the cheapest record shop in Sunderland, it was where everyone spent their hard-earned shillings, on the likes of a dance set record player or a 12-string guitar. I'd love to know what you remember about Berg's. The Blandford pub is still stubbornly here and is on our right, although no Vox Drays are here unfortunately. Did you know that Blandford Street holds some Sunderland AFC history? The fruit shop that you can see on the right of this photograph was owned by Len Duns, who played in the 1937 Sunderland AFC Cup Final. From half price furs from Canadian squirrels and ermine, to the latest waterproof footwear, I sometimes wish I could travel back in time to be able to have the choice that shops had back then. Gone are the Geordie jeans replaced by a street of charity shops. It's strange to think that Blandford Street originates as far back as the 1840s, believed to have been used as a shortcut to the railway station that was around the corner and built in 1879. Starting with names such as Ledbetter the Chemist and Arrowsmith's Bookshop, this once bustling street burst into life in the 1950s with well-known brands with everything that you could want or need. We exit Blandford Street and can see the new Sunderland station being built on the old railway station. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and I'll see you soon.